It is reported today from El Salvador that four Americans have been killed there. This was the first time that Americans seemed to have been singled out by a death squad. They were shot execution style, bullets to the back of the head. Later, their bodies were found in a shallow grave. Apparently victims of a terrorist attack. That was a wake up call. There was a great outcry. But El Salvador continues to be plagued by human rights abuses. The kind of violence that turns the stomach. Of course, the families totally believed that the US government would do whatever was necessary to bring those who had killed them to justice. I think after 30 years that it's more than enough time to make the truth known. They were people that were real, you know? They were funny. Maura loved a great Irish joke and an occasional Irish whiskey. Ida had the best and the driest sense of humor you can imagine. Mara Clark and Ida Ford were among a group of American nuns working in El Salvador. Their mission was to bring social justice by ministering to the poor, as Mara explained in an interview during a visit to the U.S. In my work, it has been very much trying to help people to realize their, their own dignity, to, to realize the great beauty that they have. But El Salvador was a country in growing crisis. Each day, El Salvador comes closer to civil war. Military repression of popular dissent had fueled a growing leftist insurgency. The U.S. backed the Salvadoran military in response, fearing the country would become the next communist domino to fall. Right-wing death squads further escalated the violence, hunting down even moderate leftists seeking political change. Death squads are believed to be responsible for more than half of the political murders committed. Among those assassinated was peace advocate Archbishop Oscar Romero, a nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. I believe they understood the danger of it. It wasn't as though they lived naively, but the violence was rampant and it was intended to create fear. In my estimation, there's a state of war. It's a civil war. And the people just feel that there is no defense there's no place to go. They were doing wonderful work. They were helping the poor people, helping the children. But in the eyes of the military, identification with the poor was the same as identification with revolution. Our people there are suffering tremendously right now. There's a great deal of fighting going on. I'm hoping very much to go back in December. On December 2nd, Mora and Ita flew into San Salvador's airport, where they were met by fellow churchwomen Jean Donovan and Dorothy Cazell. The following day, their friend, Peggy Healy, got a call. The priests had already checked everywhere. The Asuncion sisters had checked. We knew that they were missing. And so really that night, it was just waiting. They found their van that they were driving burned and by the side of the road we knew something terrible had happened. Of course, you never want to believe that or think that it's possible. We got a call in our house in Montclair about 10 o'clock Wednesday night. Told me that Eater and three other nuns had disappeared. And she said that we should assume the worst. She told us that missionaries who disappear in El Salvador are usually found dead. It wasn't until December 4th we found out I went to the scene. They were just disinterring the bodies. They were women that I had known. It was I who had to call our other sisters, and I had to tell them. It was clear that they had been raped. It was clear that they had been killed and thrown by the wayside. It was clear that there was tremendous foul play. I found the town clerk. He told me that they had heard the screams and the shots the night before, and that 
was the military who had done it. And you realize at that point that the Salvadoran military were out of control. I mean, they would kill anybody. A State Department official said that there is a strong emotional reaction to the murders in the United States, particularly in Catholic congregations. This country today announced it's suspending all economic and military aid to El Salvador. Up until this point, the Carter administration had been sending millions in aid, while also pressing the Salvadoran military to stem human rights abuses. Why is there so much violence in El Salvador? Perhaps violence is the only alternative to the subversives. Garcia would say things like, you have to respect our traditions, which simply meant the Salvadoran military had a right to kill anybody they want. But Salvadoran officials assured the U.S. that the military had played no role in the church women's murder and promised a full investigation. At the State Department, diplomatic sources say they do not believe government forces in El Salvador killed those four American women. Within weeks, the pressure of a new leftist offensive caused the U.S. to restore Salvadoran military aid. And a new American administration pledged to do even more. 30 more advisors, along with 18 more helicopters, to counter what the U.S. claims is Soviet involvement with the guerrillas. Of course, all of the families believed that the U.S. government would do whatever was necessary to bring those who had killed them to justice. It just became increasingly clear over time that they were going to be a roadblock. Gene Kirkpatrick got up and said that these weren't just nuns. The nuns were clearly not just nuns. The nuns were also political activists. We had to be a little more clear-cut about this than we usually are. One, that was not true. And two, as if that would justify the killing of these women. The families were just outraged by it. And then Secretary of State Alexander Haig said that the women could have been killed running a roadblock. Perhaps the vehicle that the nuns were riding in uh, may have tried to uh, run a roadblock or may have accidentally been perceived to have been doing so, and there have been an exchange of fire. How the U.S. government handled this case was one of the gravest damages. The signal was not sent that you cannot do this. They were mostly concerned about waging the war against communism in Central America and persuading Congress to give them the money they needed to do that. El Salvador, for example, is nearer to Texas than Texas is to Massachusetts. Central America is simply too close and the strategic stakes are too high for us to ignore the danger of governments seizing power there with ideological and military ties to the Soviet Union. Six weeks after the murders, White says he was pressured by Secretary of State Haig to send a telegram stating that the Salvadoran government was making progress in its investigation. He refused. I said, well, Mr. Secretary, the Salvadoran military killed those women. And the idea that they're going to investigate in a serious way their own crimes is simply an illusion. White was shown the door. But evidence secretly gathered by the U.S. eventually led to the arrest of several low-level National Guardsmen. And a U.S. State Department investigation produced other disturbing news. Four months, there was a cover-up. Military authorities transferred the killers to obstruct the investigation, switched rifles to make detection more difficult, destroyed evidence. It would take Salvadoran authorities a year to even arrest the right men. And then another two years, nine investigations, 200 American delegations, and Congress withholding $21 million worth of military aid to bring the men to trial. Since the State Department said it didn't find compelling evidence that higher-ups ordered the murders, the conviction of five guardsmen in 1984 promised to close the case for the U.S. But it wasn't the end of the story. Bill Ford, in particular, was determined to force the government to continue the investigation. The question still remains who ordered, who directed, who paid for this crime, and then who participated in the cover-up. Years of war hampered Ford's efforts. But the fall of the Soviet Union and the horrific 1989 assassination of six priests, a mother and a child, by U.S.-trained Salvadoran troops caused the U.S. to eventually pull back support of the Salvadoran military. Peace talks later led to a U.N. Truth Commission, which documented thousands of instances of war crimes, predominantly at the hands of government security forces. 
It also found that two top generals, Jose Guillermo Garcia and Carlos Eugenio Vides Casanova, had tried to cover up military involvement in some of these crimes, including the murders of the churchwomen. But Ford wanted to hear what happened from the convicted guardsmen themselves. And in 1998, four of them agreed to talk. The sergeant said, we have superior orders to take care of them. And everybody knew what that meant. Private Daniel Ramirez says his sergeant got orders to kill the nuns from a colonel by phone. This was planned by the high command of the armed forces. We didn't even know who these people were. Greathead told the U.S. ambassador to El Salvador that they wanted to interview the two generals who had been in charge of the military. And she looked at us and she said, oh, they're both retired and living in Florida. These two guys who had been implicated in crimes by the Truth Commission, including the murders of the churchwomen, were living in retirement in Florida? I was just astonished. Years earlier, Garcia had been given political asylum, while Vides Casanova became a permanent legal resident. Ida's brother, Bill Ford, who'd lost a civil suit seeking to hold the generals responsible for the murders, was outraged. It is shocking that people like Garcia, people like Casanova, should be allowed a comfortable retirement life in the United States. It took Congress to change that. Citing the church women's case, it passed a new law targeting accused human rights abusers for deportation. Immigration judges eventually ordered the Salvadoran generals removed from the U.S. They are appealing the decisions, saying they had no role in the murders of the churchwomen and are innocent of any crime. General Vides most certainly feels that there's been a certain level of betrayal by the U.S. government given all that he did for his country, which was aligned with the vital interests of the U.S. That is not a sufficient excuse. But there is something a bit unjust about punishing the marionettes and letting the organ grinder go on his merry way. Ford died before the cases were decided, but White was there to testify, more than 30 years after he watched the unearthing of the bodies at the scene of the crime. One of the primary tasks of an American ambassador is to protect American citizens. I regard this as completion of duty. 